Politics is the art of the possible. My name is Jimmy Carter and I'm running for president. Who knows when the fickle finger of fate may beckon you to start him. Yes, quote, unquote, another edition of the quizzical quotation game devised and introduced by Nigel Reese. Hello again, and this week we welcome a panel made up entirely of newcomers to the game. Terry Wogan, whom I'm told does some sort of breakfast programme on the radio. I never managed to hear it myself. <laughs> Ian Mc... <laughs> Ian McKellen, uh, appearing this season with the Royal Shakespeare Company. Anna Ford, a reporter, Man Alive, and the writer, the, the, uh, the indescribable, Arthur Marshall. <laughs> and to uh, break you in, team, some very easy quotations for you to recognise, as usual, trying to uh, mislead you with his impeccable delivery, the golden-voiced Ronald Fletcher. Terry Wogan, can you attribute this fairly recent remark? This girl is a marvellous swimmer. She has respect for the water, and the water has respect for her. <laughs> yes, I can, because I think, in fact, this took place at the Olympic Games in Montreal. Uh, I think it was uh, Peter Jones. Well, it was attributed to Anita Lonsborough. Yes, well, they, they shared the, the commentary in Montreal in the swimming pool. Can you remember any other of the extraordinary things which were said by commentators at the Olympics? I, um, well, there was this East German swimmer who used to take her teeth out, obviously, before she swam, and she used to come right through the water. She did a tremendous proboscis and a great protruding chin as well. Neither of which were hanging with <laughs> She wasn't a Cuban either. And she, I, she, she used to propel herself through the water by ejecting it out of her mouth. <laughs> <laughs> sort of jet propulsion. And quite the ugliest woman I've ever seen. They didn't really look like women at all anyway, uh, these East German swimmers. And at the end of it, she'd won by about 300 yards, having swum through the water like a rocket. <laughs> and he said, oh, there she is. He said, the little princess. <laughs> Well, I think you deserve about ten marks, Terry, but I'll just give you two and move on to Ian McKellen. I'm not going to get Ronald Fletcher to make this easy quotation more difficult for you to spot. I'm going to get this French lady to say it for us. Tous les parfums de l'Arabie ne purifieraient pas cette petite main. Well, if Ronald Fletcher isn't going to read it, can he identify it for me? Um, this is really why you're here, Ian. Do you recognise the quotation? No, not at all. I, it's French, is it? Oh, I see. That's. What <laughs> I knew there was some trick to it. Alors, uh, Monsieur, c'est possible que cette quotation est. De Madame Macbeth. Yes. The actual uh, quotation from Macbeth, all the perfumes of Arabia will not sweeten this little sweeten, hand. Yes. Mm. Well, before this turns mm. into celebrity squares, we'll move, <laughs> <laughs> move on to Anna Ford. Hello, Anna. With whom um, would you associate the phrase? The full-hearted consent of Parliament and people. It must be a Prime Minister or someone like that. Yes. H. Wilson? Uh, no. Um, Jay Callahan. No. <laughs> You're running out. I'm running out. Uh, Ted Heath. Now, why yes, would Ted Heath have said that? <laughs> well, it was Edward Heath in May 1970 saying that going into Europe would be oh. such a big step that it should only be undertaken with the full-hearted consent of Parliament and people. When the business of a referendum came up, uh, people seized on this uh, um, remark as justifying a referendum. At least Heath didn't say on that, didn't refer on that occasion to our people. That I hate it when politicians and indeed union leaders refer to our people as if somehow the rest of us belong to them. We, we very rarely vote for them or care about what they say, but we're always their people. <laughs> Are there any questions? <laughs> now it's turning into any questions. Um, <laughs> Arthur Marshall, who said this? Which of us has not felt in his heart a half-warmed fish? 
<laughs> well, I think that, that that lovely Oxford gentleman who got things the, um, the wrong way around, I think it's Dr. Spooner. Well, it was the Oxford. Reverend Spooner, yes. The Reverend a, Spooner. A Spoonerism you get to, Mark. Now, can you think of any other Spoonerisms? Oh, um, um, when he gave out the title of a hymn, Kinkering Kongs, their titles tight, or something. <laughs> <laughs> and when he, when he was sending down some undergraduate for slacking, he said, you, uh, you, you must be sent down, you have tasted, tasted the whole worm. Instead of wasting the whole term. <laughs> <laughs> well done, and back to Terry Wogan. Um, Terry, can you tell me where this phrase originated? I made him an offer he couldn't refuse. Um, probably the BBC contracts department. <laughs> <laughs> I think more like it has a touch of the mafiosa yes. about it, hasn't it? And um, it may well have originated in that uh, I'm the only one in the universe who never saw the movie of The Godfather, but it may have originated in the book by Mario Puzo. Yes, you get your marks for that. It was, in fact, uh, from the book in the film, which you haven't seen, and you'll now have a chance to hear a bit of the soundtrack. It's delivered in a slightly altered form by Marlon Brando. Grand. You spend time with your family? Sure I do. Good. Because a man who doesn't spend time with his family can never be a real man. You look terrible. I want you to eat. I want you to rest well, and a month from now, this Hollywood big shot's going to give you what you want. Too late. They start shooting in a week. I'm going to make him an offer he can't refuse. There you are, Marlon Brando. I think, judging by Marlon Brando's addiction on that, he should be playing Lady Macbeth quite soon. <laughs> <laughs> he never got over on the waterfront, did he? No. He's e exactly like he was on the waterfront, except for this, they put something in his jaw. They, they put or orange peel or That's cotton or something to, to, yeah. to his face in. Yes. It still sounds like S.J. Perelman with a hangover. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ian McKellen, um, also for you, uh, something to do with the film star, who said this? What when drunk... One sees in other women, one sees in Garbo sober. Oh, well, that's a very nice compliment, isn't it? And it was made by someone who'd worked with her, was it? Um, no, it was said by a critic, actually. A critic? <laughs> Kenneth Tynan? Yes, Kenneth Tynan. Well done. <laughs> I should say that the amount of solidarity on the panel uh, this week <laughs> has to be seen to be believed. Anna Ford, can you tell me where this descriptive phrase comes from? Feather-footed through the plashy fern passes the questing bow. <laughs> <laughs> yes. A wild guess that it's not from the wind in the willows. You get probably five marks for saying that, yes? Excellent, excellent. Um, that it, I think it was said by Evelyn Waugh. Yes, where, where did he say it? Well, that I'm not sure of. Is Anybody know? a book called Scoop? Yes, our yes. partial. And isn't there a terrible journalist who writes an awful sort of... Oh, he pre pretends to be a journalist, writes a terrible nature article every week, and it's called Guests at My Tit Table. <laughs> <laughs> well, you may think that. In fact, <laughs> what it is called, the, the, the nature column, is Lush Places. <laughs> which is not quite what you said and uh, it's in a newspaper called the Daily Beast and you may remember that this country columnist gets sent off by mistake to cover a civil war with hysterical results um, <laughs> finally in this round Arthur Marshall for you a quote from who's who in whose entry would you have found the words educated in the holidays from Eton oh I have heard that um, there were three of them yes. there was Edith uh, and Edith, Edith Sitwell, and Edith's father kept saying, you know, she was a brilliant poetess, what a shame that she never took up lawn tennis. And there was Edith, and there was Osbert, and there was Sir Cheverell, who is now Sir Sir Cheverell, and if you can say Sir Sir Cheverell three times running, you're cleverer than I am. But I think it must, it was Osbert Sitwell. Yes, it was Osbert Sitwell. Um, any other who's, who-isms? Um, no, it's one of the most boring books in the entire world, and nine out of the ten are total mystery personalities who only exist in the pages of Who's Who. I very much doubt if they're alive at all. I think the only interesting thing about Who's Who is that Wedgie Ben's entry gets shorter every year, apparently. With that relief, much thanks. Um, let me just, uh, at the end of that round, take a look at the score, and really, you're all absolutely neck and neck, so well done.
<laughs> now to what you might call applied quotations, phrases which have been used as the titles of books. I'd like to know who used them and where they got them from. Terry Wogan. My heart belongs. We to Daddy? Several spring to mind, yes, as you say. Could be to Daddy, could be to Glasgow. Well, there was a song called My Heart Belongs to Daddy, but I suppose that's pretty irrelevant, is it not? No, it's very extremely relevant. Yes. Da -ha 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 -ha. Was it the person who actually sang the thing? Who made her name by singing it, I'll tell you this, in the Cole Porter biopic, Night and Day, in 1946. And she used it as the title of her autobiography, recently. Good grief. Ian McKellen is writing the answer down even I now. I have a Scot here on my right-hand side with <laughs> Irish antecedents who tells me Carol Channing... Ha-ha, <laughs> <laughs> well, he's wrong. Well, then. <laughs> he is no friend of mine. <laughs> Doris Day. No, no, you can't... Let me oh, look I know who it is. I know, it's the, it's the lady in... Can I, am I allowed to speak? Go on. All right, Ian. Having written, it's the lady who's in South Pacific, the film of... Yeah. Mary Martin. Yes, <laughs> Now, this is obviously a ploy by Ian McKellen to give Terry Wogan the wrong answer. Yes. <laughs> and to, to leap in with the right one. No, yeah. I would like publicly to hand over any marks I'm receiving that to, to Terry Wogan. How about one each? I hate that kind of crawling. I'd rather not have... <laughs> I'd rather not have anything at all, Nigel, if you don't mind. All right. To, to save you 89 million letters, I don't think that Mary Martin did the film at all. I think it was Mitzi Gaynor. It was. Oh, yes. 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 Just yes. to save your correspondence. Right. The film that Mary Martin made, as I said, was the Cole Porter biopic, Night and Day, and here she is singing the song. Oh, God. While tearing off a game of God, I may make a play for the caddy, but when I do, I don't follow through, cause my heart belongs to death. Mary Martin, well, we, we, we've resolved that one, then. I uh, hope the book was better than the rendition. <laughs> it was a long time ago. Ian McKellen, your title is... Anglo-Saxon Attitudes. Who used it? Where does it come from? Isn't that Evelyn War? Uh, no. Attitudes? No. Is it a comic book? It is a comic book. Comic-ish, yeah. yes. Well, now, Arthur Marshall should know that. Yes, it looks as if he does. <laughs> yes. Well, it isn't Evelyn War, it, it, but it's, um... Angus Wilson, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> With a little help from your friends, you can tell yeah. me that it's Angus Wilson's novel. Now, where does the title come from? I have no idea. Uh, I'll offer it to the others for a mark. We'll tell I you don't know why you have to be such a sneak about us helping each other, Nigel, in the first no. place. We're only trying to make this a jolly game that all at home can play. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you where that came from. It was what the White King says in Alice Through the Looking Glass, or Through the Looking Glass and What Alice Found There by Lewis Carroll. Someone oh. is seen approaching very slowly and striking curious attitudes. The messenger kept skipping up and down and wriggling like an eel as he came along, with his great hands spread out like fans on each side. He's an Anglo-Saxon messenger, said the king, and those are Anglo-Saxon attitudes. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't believe me, you'll have to go and reread the book. Anna Ford, your title is... Eating people is wrong. <laughs> it's somebody like Desmond. Des Des Desmond. Not Desmond O'Connor. No, not Desmond O'Connor. Eating people is wrong. Eating people is wrong. I'll offer it to the others. It was... Ian McKellar? Michael Flanders who sang it. Yes. And Donald Swan who wrote, played the music, but who wrote it... But you may never know. Was well, it the same chap that subsequently had an enormous success with Jaws? No, it wasn't. <laughs> no. No. Ah. It was a novel by Malcolm Bradbury, which took its title, as Ian McKellen correctly says, from a song called The Reluctant Cannibal by Flanders and Swan, which goes like this. People have always eaten people. What else is there to eat? If the juju had meant us not to eat people... He wouldn't have made us of meat. <laughs> so these people are oh, no, not again. I want to eat people all the day long. Don't eat people. He keeps on repeating. Eating people, people is wrong. <laughs> Flanders and Swan sadly missed. Um, finally, in this round for you, Arthur Marshall, I'm going to reverse the procedure. You might think that E.M. Forster borrowed the title of one of his novels from a song by Noel Card. Do you know which one I'm thinking of? Good gracious me, I'm totally baffled. 
better get in quick before Ian McCallum does. Um... Or oh, Terry Wogue. Mm-hmm. Well, it can't. <laughs> <laughs> a view was... with a view. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well done. And at the end of that round, I may tell you that uh, Ian McKellen is um, way out in front, just two points ahead of Arthur Marshall. Now, at this point in the quiz, I stop putting questions to the panel and ask them simply to tell me whether they have a favourite quotation, funny or serious, which they're always trotting out or which they're fond of to the point of having written down or carrying it about to them. Terry Wogan, what, is, what are you always telling people? Well, I'm always telling people that being two points ahead is not tremendously far ahead of anybody else. <laughs> so, who, who said yeah, that? Yeah. You did. Um, <laughs> I like Patrick Campbell. He's quoting S.J. Perelman, and he, he said, he happened to say to Sidney Perelman one day, hmm, that's a nice tobacco you're smoking. He said, where'd you get that, Sid? And he said, Patty, even as we speak, Turkish doxies of unimaginable beauty are rolling my backy between their golden ties. <laughs> <laughs> We move on rapidly to Ian McKellum. <laughs> Ian McKellum, what's your favourite quotation? There was earlier this century uh, uh, an actor I n- never saw perform called Andrew McMaster. Now, Terry will know of him because um, during Terry's life, even, uh, Andrew McMaster was touring with his Shakespeare company around the smaller communities of Ireland. And um, this entailed on Sundays travelling from place to place by the equivalent of uh, British Rail. Irish Rail? <laughs> <laughs> They were long journeys and, and hot. And uh, as the train pulled up at a particularly small station, uh, McMaster left his wife in the carriage and wound down the window and stuck his head out, uh, which was wearing a beautiful wide-brimmed hat and an SS scarf, and uh, slight, with a slightly theatrical gesture, hailed the only person in sight who was the porter and uttered the first line of uh, Twelfth Night. What country friend is this? To which the porter, sizing up the situation, quick as a flash, replied to the second line of the play, This is Illyria, lady. (laughs) (laughs) Lovely. Um, Anna Ford. Well, I remember having read to me and also reading when I was young The Water Babies by Charles Kingsley and getting rather fed up by the moralistic tones of that book, particularly the the Mrs. Doers You Would Be Done Bys, and those sort of people that occur rather often. And I like the reversion that George Bernard Shaw has done to Mrs. Doers You Would Be Done By in, her maxims, in his Maxims Revolutionaries, when he says, Do not do unto others as you would they should do unto you. Their tastes may not be the same. <laughs> Arthur Marshall. Um, This is from one of my favourite authors, P.G. Woodhouse, and it's about um, one of Bertie Wooster's aunts called Aunt Agatha, and it's a way of expressing astonishment. Something very astonishing has happened to Aunt Agatha, and the text goes, she wore the surprised look of somebody who, picking daisies on the down line, has just received the 415 in the small of the back. (laughs) That's gorgeous. Many thanks, panel, for your (laughs) ideas. Well, that's what the panel likes. But what are your favourite quotations listening at home? We've had a marvellous response to the request we made in the first programme of the series, you to let us know what quotes you cherish. I've singled out a few. Uh, Richard Graham, of Melton Constable in Norfolk, comes up with a Goldwynism I hadn't heard before. Sam Goldwyn, the uh, film producer who always got things the wrong way round, was once observed standing at the rails of an ocean liner as it left for Europe. He was calling down to his friends on the quay, Bon voyage! (laughs) (laughs) Another another one for the collection. And uh, Susan Moss, a state-registered nurse from Kensington, sends us what she says is a useful misquote she uses frequently in her work. I'm not sure how. Um, It's from P.G. Woodhouse, too. What Aunt Dahlia said to Bertie Worcester 
when he grew a moustache. Is this the face that stopped a thousand clocks? <laughs> <laughs> John L. Hutchinson from Walsall in the East Midlands likes what Dr. Hjalmar Schacht is reported to have said when told of Hitler's suicide in 1945. I wouldn't believe Hitler was dead even if he told me so himself. <laughs> And uh, Mr. M. Hosier of London, WC1, treasures a quotation from a radio weather forecast in 1969. Perhaps it was read by you, Ron. <laughs> it could have been, <laughs> yes. The weather will be cold. There are two reasons for this. One is the temperatures will be lower. <laughs> well, to all our correspondents, a very big thank you. We'll read out some more of your favourite quotations next week. Now, back to the quiz. And to some uh, famous last words. Uh, whether you think they're famous last words or not rather depends on whether you recognise them. First, fictional last words for uh, Terry Wogan, set unexpectedly to music. It's a And he died. He did, yes. <laughs> it comes from a musical that I, I was lucky enough not to see because it folded very quickly, didn't it? Edward Wood, 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 Wood. It's from A Tale of Two Cities, yes, the musical fact, of that. Yes, the musical was called... Which was called A, a Tale... It no. wasn't called A Tale of Two Cities. That was the thing about it. It was called something else entirely. <laughs> That's why it's stuck in my memory. It was just called Two, two cities. cities. Two Cities. Two Cities, as simple as that. It reminds me of a story about an opera. My grandfather went to the opera in Manchester... And in the last act, the tenor has to carry off the leading lady who has died. And she was rather large, as leading ladies sometimes are. And somebody from the back row shouted, Take what you can and come back for the rest. <laughs> just, just, <laughs> just going back to uh, the, uh, the musical and the quotation, the, the Two Cities musical even contains a knitting song which has to be heard to be believed. Um, and in the original novel, A Tale of Two Cities, there's a bit more to the quotation, Ronnie. It is a far, far better thing that I do than I've ever done. It is a far, far better rest that I go to than I have ever known. Right, now moving on to Ian McKellen. Some words for you which sound final, but turn out not to have been. And so I take myself to that course which is almost as much as to see myself into my grave, for which and all the comforts that will accompany by being blind, the good God prepare me. <clears throat> Another easy one. Someone in a predicament, isn't it? Uh, 17th century? Hey, offer it to the others. Milton went blind, didn't he? Well, a sort of contemporary of Milton's. It wasn't, these are, in fact, the last words of Samuel Pepys's diary. The 31st of May, 1669, when he thought he was going blind, that's why he gave up writing the diary. In fact, he didn't go blind, and he lived on for another 30 years. Having a jolly good time. What did he actually die of? Don't ask. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> he died of death. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Anna Ford, again, uh, these sound like somebody's last words, although, in fact, they're not. Après nous, le déluge. You must have heard those words before. <laughs> After us, the flood. Yes, I remember being used in another context, but, um, Madame de Pompadour. Madame de Pompadour. I don't know why she said it. I mean, was it very rainy that year? <laughs> <laughs> it was after a battle. A battle of Rossbach in 1757. What was the context you had heard it quoted in? It was a man called Keith Flood who won an election. And the man before him who'd been in that seat said, Après moi, le déluge. <laughs> very nice. <much. laughs> Arthur Marshall, these are very nearly somebody's last words. He said them the night before he died. I would rather have written that poem, gentlemen, than take Quebec. Wolf. Yes. Now, what was the poem? Oh, my goodness me. Well, I can't imagine. Anybody? Was it Pope? No, it was Gray's Elegy. Hmm. Oh, Gray's Elegy. Wolf said that he would rather have written that poem than take it. You've me. left out one of my very famous, um, um, genuine last words, which was William Pitt. 
dying at the age of 47, and they bent over to hear what this great man might be saying. And what he was saying was, I think I could eat one of Bellamy's veal pies. <laughs> Did you, do, you, do you mind the, the last words of Gertrude Stein? When she was, she was lying in a chaise long in Paris, and Alice B. Toklas, who'd been her constant companion, <laughs> leaned over and said, Gertrude, she said, Gertrude, what's the answer? And she propped herself up and said, What's the question? <laughs> Lovely. And so, finally, a last look at the score, which tells me that this week, uh, joint winners are Ian McKellen and Arthur Marshall. And uh, we'll leave you this week with another quotation sent in by a listener. Sheila Fielding of Menston near Ilkley in Yorkshire tells me that this is her favourite quotation, which she has been aching to share. It's from a letter to the Birmingham Evening Mail in May 1972. I should like to think that the gentleman who created King Kong would have been more gainfully employed in making a set of concrete steps at the Ashton Road end of Bracebridge Street to help old people to get to the bus stops without <laughs> making half-mile detours. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Taking part in Quote Unquote this week were Anna Ford, Arthur Marshall, Ian McKellen and Terry Wogan. The quotations were read by me, Ronald Fletcher. The programme was devised and introduced by Nigel Rees and produced by John Lloyd.